Good morning. My name is Dominique Godfrey Johnson. I'm one of the subject matter experts for the BSI event chapter. Welcome to all our participants, whether you are joining us in person or via web stream. So let's continue with, with day two and move to a hot topic, primary BSIs. This may take, this presentation may take one cup of coffee or two, but we will get through it together. I will discuss laboratory confirmed bloodstream infections or primary BSIs. My colleague Latasha Powell will discuss secondary BSIs in a later session. So what are my expectations? I have expectations of you. I expect that everyone is alert and excited about primary BSIs. After all, it's our favorite topic. What I do not expect is an audience that has fallen asleep before we reach the exciting topics. And believe you me, there are some exciting things in this presentation. So what are the objectives? The objectives are to uh, provide an overview of the training resources, protocol, and supporting materials, define key terms for device-associated infections, specifically CLAPSIs, discuss device-associated infection surveillance changes for 2019, and provide an overview of the data collection process for MAP NHSN locations. And this will include both the numerator and denominator. And finally, we will assess our knowledge about current BSI through case studies. This is just a plug for the Healthcare Associated Infections Progress Report. Since this presentation was posted to the website, the 2017 HAI report has been published. I would like to highlight a few important points related to the report and specifically CLAPSIs. As you know, CDC is working towards the elimination of HAIs. The infection data included in this report are those data reported to NHSN. U.S. hospitals reported a significant decrease in CLAPSIs between 2016 and 2017. And the HAI progress report provides summary of select HAIs across four healthcare settings. These settings are your acute care, your critical access, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, and long-term acute care hospitals. So where can I find the BSI protocol? Under the protocols tab, the BSI chapter is listed first. Next is the bloodstream infection link, and this will open the BSI protocol. We will discuss this protocol in great detail today. You should also familiarize yourselves with chapter two, which was presented which was presented yesterday. This last highlighted area is the link that will take you to chapter two. This chapter provides the foundation on how to identify HAIs, including BSIs. Under the training tab, you will find numerous training videos and accompanying slides. These resources are kept current and new content is added when it becomes available. For example, our newest BSI Quick Learn on denominator device day counts and central line day counts for making a CLAPSI determination was posted on December of 2018. What about the frequently asked questions? The Frequently Asked Questions tab contains those pressing questions we receive from IPs about bloodstream infections, bloodstream infection surveillance, analysis, and annual surveys. These are just examples of the information found on this page. The BSI FAQ is an invaluable document that contains answers to most of the to some of the most frequent and more difficult concepts related to BSI surveillance. As you can see from the screenshot, the FAQs are sorted by topic.
Finally, under the supporting materials section, you will find important resources such as key terms or chapter 17, which is the site-specific infection definitions for secondary BSI determination and the NHSN organism list that you would need for BSI surveillance. This organism list is an Excel file with individual tabs at the bottom listing all organisms, your common commensals, and your MBI organisms. Please make sure you are referencing the most recent material. Now we will move on to definitions that you will use when identifying BSI events. Let's begin with the infection window period. The infection window period in which all is the period in which all BSIs must be met. It includes the collection date of the first blood specimen that identifies an organism, the three calendar days before and the three calendar days after. The LCBI date of event is always the date of the, of the blood specimen. The positive blood specimen with a recognized pathogen is the only element needed to meet this criterion. So for LCBI1, no signs or symptoms are needed. This is in contrast to LCBI2 and 3 criteria. For LCBI2 or 3, the date of event is the date the first element is used to meet LCBI2 or 3 criteria and it, that occurs during the BSI infection window period. There are two elements needed to meet LCBI 2 and 3, a symptom and two blood specimens that are matching common commensals or companion cultures. If the two blood specimens are collected on consecutive days, they are considered a single element for meeting the criteria. The date of the first blood specimen will set the IWP. All BSIs are either a primary source of infection or secondary to another site-specific infection, such as your urinary tract infections, your surgical site infections, your ventilator-associated events, your pneumonias, or one of the Chapter 17 definitions. Laboratory-confirmed bloodstream infections, or LCBIs, are bloodstream infections that occur when an organism has been identified in the blood and it is not related to an infection at another source. All primary BSIs create a 14-day repeat infection time frame, or RIT. This repeat infection time frame is a, time, a period of time in which no new infections of the same type are reported. Secondary BSIs are bloodstream infections that are not reported as an LCBI because they are associated with a site-specific infection at another body site, which has seeded the bloodstream. Secondary bloodstream infections do not create an RIT, but rather the primary source of the secondary BSI creates the RIT and no new infections of that specific type will be reported. Your secondary BSI attribution period or your SBAP is the period in which a blood specimen must be collected for secondary BSI attribution. The SBAP includes the infection window period and the repeat infection time frame. It can be 14 to 17 days depending on the date of event. Now let's review an eligible organism. This is an organism eligible to meet LCBI or MBI LCBI criteria. Eligible BSI organisms are not excluded organisms. The definition of a central line is an intravascular catheter that terminates at or close to the heart or in one of the great vessels, which is used for infusion, withdrawal of blood, or hemodynamic monitoring. 
Neither the type of device nor the insertion site will determine if a line qualifies as a central line. Patients must have one or more qualifying central lines to be included in CLAPSI surveillance. In order to meet the central line definition, you must ask yourself two questions. Where does the tip terminate and how is the line being used? A few points regarding central lines are patients must have one or more qualifying central lines for inclusion in CLAPSI surveillance. Infection surveillance for NHSN is not aimed at a particular device, but instead is identifying the risks patients have as a result of using the device. NHSN also does not attribute any bloodstream infection to a specific device. On the slide, you will see a list of great vessels available for use in making determinations about central lines for CLAPSI reporting in device day counts. If a line has a lumen and terminates at or close to the heart or in one of the great vessels and is used for the purposes listed above, it is a central line. Once it is deemed a central line, it continues to be a central line until it is discontinued, which means removal from the body, or the patient is discharged, whichever comes first. We receive a fair number of questions about a line that has migrated out or sometimes has intentionally been pulled back, and this is seen on the chest x-ray. This does not eliminate the line from being, an eligible, from being eligible for a CLAPSI event, nor does it stop the central line day count. When considering a CLAPSI event, you must consider access. Access is defined as the performance of any of the following activities during the current inpatient admission, line placement, and use of any central line for infusion, withdrawal of blood, or hemodynamic monitoring. Once a central line has been accessed in an inpatient unit, it is eligible for a CLAPSI event until the day after it is discontinued or the patient is discharged, whichever comes first. Discontinued in this case means, again, removal from the body. Access is an important concept, especially when you have a central line or implanted port that is present on admission. If it was not placed during the current admission, the first time it is used as an inpatient for medication administration, blood draws, or fluid administration, the line is then considered access. An eligible central line is a central line that has been in place greater than two consecutive calendar days following the first access of the central line in an inpatient location during the current admission. These lines remain eligible for CLAPSI events until the day after removal from the body or the patient is discharged, whichever comes first. Dialysis patients who have a line that is only used by dialysis personnel are included in central line day counts for the location where they are physically housed and the patients must be included in any CLAPSI surveillance being performed in that location. For NHSN reporting purposes, central lines are categorized as temporary, permanent, and in neonates umbilical catheters. A temporary line is a non-tonal, non-implanted catheter compared to a permanent line, which is a tonal catheter, including certain dialysis catheters, which may, which may include your implanted ports. Finally, an umbilical catheter is inserted through the umbilical artery or vein in a neonate. It is only necessary to distinguish between temporary or permanent lines when reporting specialty care areas like oncology, dialysis, or your transplant unit. 
In these locations, central lines are stratified by line type for monthly denominator reporting because these specialty care areas serve, high, serve patients with a higher risk and therefore are more likely to use permanent lines because they have a lower risk of infection compared to your temporary lines. For specialty care areas, if a permanent and temporary line are present, report the temporary line in your denominator. If there is a BSI event, the NHSN application will attribute the BSI event to the temporary line and include this line in the denominator count. Other than specialty care areas, many patients have more than one central line and can have a combination of different types of lines. For NHSN reporting purposes, when multiple lines are present in the same patient, report only one central line per day. This is a list of devices that are not considered central lines for NHSN reporting purposes. Now let's briefly discuss introducers. Introducers may or may not count as a central line. Most people don't think of an introducer as a central line, but realize that they are considered intravascular devices depending on the location of the tip. The protocol states that pacing wires and other non-lumen catheters are not considered central lines, and this is true. But there are pacing wires that have a lumen specifically designed for infusion, withdrawal of blood, and hemodynamic monitoring. If a patient has a line that you are unsure about, just contact us at, NHS, at nhsn at cdc.gov and let us know the line type, how it's being used, and any other pertinent information, and we'll be happy to provide guidance regarding the line. So here's a little note on excluded organisms. Any organism not on the common commensal list is, ex is considered a recognized pathogen for reporting LCBIs with the exception of the organisms listed on this slide. You may notice that all of these excluded pathogens are enteric or gut bugs. These organisms are eligible for use in secondary BSI determinations, but will not be reported as the sole pathogen in a primary BSI. New in 2019 is the removal of viruses and parasites from the LCBI definition. However, these pathogens are also eligible for use in secondary BSI determinations. Organisms in the right column are excluded from all NHSN organisms, from all NHSN definitions. These infections are almost always community acquired, and since they tend to have really long incubation periods, they may be incorrectly identified. Group B strep remains excluded as a causative organism for eclapsia in the first six days of life. Group B strep often causes infections in newborns as a result of vertical transmis transmission or passage through the birth canal. When, group B strep, when the group B strep exclusion is met, these events are considered LCBIs and will create a BSI RIT, but are not central line associated. We have reviewed the definitions key to, BS, to BSI surveillance. Now let's recap denominator device day counts and central line day counts for making a CLAPSI determination. So for central lines, do we count days of admission or days of access. We've received questions on how to count denominator device days. For denominator device day counts, you would start the first day the central line is present on an inpatient location. If the line is inserted during the current admission, day one 
is the first day, excuse me, for denominator device counts, you would start the first day the central line is present on an inpatient unit. If the line is inserted during the current emission, day one is the first day the central line is present on an inpatient unit. If the central line was present on admission, day one is the first day the patient is admitted to an inpatient location, regardless of access. The second count is the central line day counts for making a CLAPSI determination. To attribute a central line to a BSI event, you must count the days of access. A central line becomes an eligible central line for a CLAPSI determination once the central line has been accessed for greater than two consecutive calendar days. Let's look at the next two slides to further explain these concepts. Patient A has a central line inserted in the ICU. Because the central line was inserted in an inpatient location, day one will begin the denominator device day count. Patient A will have seven denominator device days from 331 through 46. Patient C has a central line at the time of admission to ICU. Because patient C is admitted to ICU on 331, the denominator device day count will begin on the day of admission. On day three, the central line was removed and replaced on day four. Because a calendar day did not pass without a central line in place, the denominator device day count will continue until 4-5 when the central line is removed. On 4-6, there is no device in place. Patient C will have six denominator device days beginning 331 through 4-5. Okay. And lastly, patient E. Patient E has a non-access port at the time of admission to ICU. The denominator device day count will begin on the date the patient is admitted to ICU. Assessing the port on 4-3 does not change the denominator device day count. Patient E will have seven denominator device days, 331 through 4-6. This is a snippet of the table from the BSI protocol. The complete table is found on page 4-22. Now let's look at the days of access and the central line day count for making a CLAPSI determination. This is a snippet of examples from Table 4 and illustrates device association as determined by the presence of an eligible central line on the BSI date of event or the day before. So patient A becomes eligible for a CLAPSI on 4-4 because an access port had been in place for some portion of greater than two consecutive calendar days making it an eligible central line on 4-4. The port remains eligible for eclapsy until it is removed or the patient is discharged, whichever comes first. Patient B becomes eligible for eclapsy on 4-4, central line day three through 4-5. An access central line had been in place greater than two consecutive calendar days, making it an eligible central line on 4-4. Please note the central line was in place a portion of the day on 4-4. A BSI date of event on the day of or the day after device removal or the patient is discharged will still be considered a device associated infection or in this case, a collapsing. And finally, patient C. 
Patient C becomes eligible for eclapsy on 331 through 46 because a central line had been in place greater than two consecutive calendar days. A BSI date of event occurring on the day of or the day after device removal or pac patient discharge is considered a device-associated infection or eclapsy. Although the central line was removed on 4-2, the patient remains eligible for a collapse event through 4-6 because a full calendar day did not pass without a central line in place. Therefore, the central line counts continue. Okay. We've made it through the denominator device day counts and central line day counts for making eclapsy determinations. If you still have any questions about that, I will be available after the primary BSI session and you can come up and ask me then. Or if we have time for Q&A, whichever you prefer. Next, we will discuss changes and revisions in 2019, specifically CLAPSI exclusions. A CLAPSI exclusion is provided if a patient has an ECMO device or a ventricular assist device in place greater than two consecutive calendar days on the bloodstream infection date of event and the device is still in place on the date of event or the day before. If the patient meets criteria for either of the above exclusions, you would enter central line equals yes. There is an LCBI event and a 14-day BSI RIT is created with day one being the date of event. The ECMO and VAD data fields are required in 2019. Please note this is a change in the in the reporting instructions from 2018. And I want to put a pin here and say for all of the CLAPSI exclusions that we will discuss, you should keep in mind that the patient has an eligible organism identified and an eligible central line. There is also a CLAPSI exclusion provided for observed or suspected patient self-injection into their vascular access. Please note that this exclusion requires an observation or suspicion of patient injection. Behaviors such as biting, picking at, or sucking on the central line access will not meet this exclusion. The, top, the documentation must indicate the observation or suspicion of injection occurred during the IWP of the positive blood specimen and must be entered concurrently. The next exclusion is for epidermolysis bullosa, which is a genetic connective tissue skin disorder that makes the skin extremely fragile. This disorder causes the skin to blister and or tear. EB patients tend to develop wounds that are heavenly colonized with bacteria, placing individuals with this condition at an increased risk for bloodstream infections. Additionally, cl clinicians are unable to collect skin cultures on these patients because they are so heavily colonized and the culturing process is painful. An exclusion is provided for this condition if a clinician documents this disorder during the patient's current admission. Munchausen syndrome by proxy, also known as fictitious disorder imposed on another, is a mental illness condition in which a caregiver makes up or causes an illness or injury in a person under his or her care such as a child, an elderly patient, or a person with disabilities for personal attention. To meet this criteria, 
a clinician must document a confirmed or suspected diagnosis during the patient's admission. If a patient meets criteria for any of the above exclusions, you would enter central line equal no into the NHSN application or the BSI event form. Entering no in the central line field will, will remove these events from the numerator and the events are not considered central line associated. These events are also LCBIs and a 14-day BSI RIT is created with day one being the date of event. These exclusions are available on the BSI event form. These fields are optional in 2019, but will become required in 2020. The last collapse exclusion we will discuss is pus at the vascular access site. If a patient meets all elements for this exclusion listed on the slide, you would enter central line is equal to no in the NHSN application. The event again is considered an LCBI and a 14 day BSI RIT is created with day one being the date of event. This exclusion is also available if you're reporting using the BSI event form. Again, this field is optional in 2019, but will become required in 2020. Here is a list of vascular access devices located in the PUS at the vascular site CLAPSI exclusion. This is a summary of the 2019 CLAPSI exclusions previously discussed. This is table three on page 4-13. Now I will discuss LCBI criteria. This is the hierarchy for laboratory confirmed bloodstream infections. As mentioned earlier, all BSIs are either a primary source of infection or secondary to another site specific infection like your urinary tract infections, your surgical site infections, your ventilator associated events, pneumonias, or any of the chapter 17 definitions. There are three different LCBI criteria. LCBI 1, LCBI 2, and LCBI 3. This is a step-by-step -step process that may help when making a BSI determination. CLAPSI surveillance will always start with a positive blood specimen, whether it's culture or non-culture based. If you determine you have a POA event, as in step four, there is nothing to report. Step five is where you would determine if the CLAPSI definition is met. As a reminder, all blood specimens, regardless of the collection site or the reason for collection, must be included in CLAPSI surveillance. An LCBI is identified when a patient of any age has a recognized bacterial or fungal pathogen not included on the NHSN common commensal list, identified from one or more blood specimens by culture or non-culture based microbiologic testing, and the organism identified in the blood is, related, is not related to an infection at another site. If the BSI is secondary to another primary source of infection, it will not be reported to NHSN as an LCBI or as a CLAPSI. The primary source may be reported dependent, depending on your monthly reporting plan and state mandates, but the secondary BSI will not. Primary BSIs are identified by ruling out secondary sources. A bloodstream infection cannot be secondary to another bloodstream infection. 
Therefore, a primary BSI will never have a secondary BSI attribution period. I will not discuss secondary BSIs in this presentation. However, you must always consider a primary source for all BSIs. So let's switch gears and perform a few knowledge checks. I know you've been sitting for a while and taking in all of this wonderful information. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. Let's see if you can make a determination about this scenario using Poll Everywhere. If you are joining us, joining us via web stream, please participate as well. Okay, are we ready? So some of you may be familiar with Poll Everywhere. This is the same slide that you saw on yesterday. And many of you have participated in several of the polls on yesterday. As a reminder, once I ask the question and list the answer choices, cell phone users can participate by texting the message NHSN to 22333 to join. Again, the number is 22333, and the message you are texting is NHSN. Next, you, receive, you will receive a text confirming that you have joined Cheryl Williams' polling session. Once you receive that confirmation text, you can text back the letter that corresponds to your answer. Lastly, for cell phone users that join via text message, once you've joined the polling sessions for today, you will not need to rejoin for the remainder of my presentation or the presentations that follow throughout the day. If you choose to participate via web browser on your cell phone, computer, or any other mobile device, here's the website that you can visit. You should see the following welcome screen in your browser. Okay, so let's begin. So we have Mr. On Edge, who was admitted to MICU after having a heart attack as denoted by his name, he's on edge. On February 4th, a central line was placed in MICU. On February 7th, a blood culture was collected due to fever and chills, and the blood culture was positive for Seratia marcescens, which is a recognized pathogen. No other source of infection was identified. Is this an LCBI? Please choose the letter that corresponds to the correct response. Okay, well, we, we basically, we all answer that one. And so, yes, this is an LCBI. Let's look at Mr. On Edge's rationale. Mr. On Edge had a positive blood specimen for Seratia marcescens on 2-7. Because this is the only element required to meet LCBI 1 criterion, 2-7 is the date of event. The 2-7 blood culture will create a BSI IWP from 2-4 to 210. A BSI RIT is established from 27 to 220. The BSI event is central line associated because the central line was in place four calendar days on the date of event. Let's move on to LCBI 2-3 criteria. When reviewing LCBI 2 and 3 definitions, these definitions share some similarities with the exception that the symptoms for meeting the criterion are based on age. So LCBI-2 is for use in any age patient and LCBI-3 provides symptoms that are commonly present in patients less than or equal to one year of age, such as hypothermia, apnea, and or bradycardia. Please note, patients less than or equal to one year of age also may meet LCBI-1 
or LCBI2 criteria because these criteria are for any aged patient. Additionally, the organisms identified are not related to an infection at another site and the common commensals are drawn on, on separate occasions and must match. Let's review matching organisms or companion cultures. When determining the sameness of organisms, only the genus and species should be used to make this determination. If one organism is less definitively identified than the other, the identification must be complementary for NHSN reporting purpose. For example, a blood culture growing a coad negative staph and a blood culture growing staph epidermidis are considered a match because staph epidermidis is a coad negative staph. In another example, a blood culture growing coad negative staph and a blood culture growing staphylococcus are not considered matching because staphylococcus can either be coag negative or coag positive. The table listed at the bottom of the page can be found on page 4-20 of the BSI protocol and can help answer questions about reporting differing lab results. All right, let's look at Ms. Positive Polly. On March 18th, Ms. Positive Polly was admitted to the, to the oncology ward and a port was placed for chemotherapy. On March 19th, she developed a fever of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. March 21st, blood cultures were collected that grew coagulase negative staph times two. On March 22nd, repeat blood cultures were collected, growing the same organism. No other source of infection was identified. Is this a POA or HAI bloodstream infection? Okay, this is a POA bloodstream infection. Let's look at Miss Positive Polly's rationale. Miss Polly had two positive blood specimens for CNS on 321. The 321 positive blood specimen creates a 318 through 324 infection window period. A fever is noted on 319. Because the fever is the first element identified during the IWP, 319 is your date of event. Note, the date of event occurs during the POA time frame and the patient would have a POA BSI and a POA BSI RIT is established from 319 to 41. Let's look at the next scenario. On April 1st, Four-month-old Baby Gray was admitted a free brow with no symptoms of an infection. On April 2nd, he developed fever and periods of bradycardia. Two blood cultures were collected. One specimen grew micrococcus. Does this meet LCBI criteria?
few more seconds. Okay, so the correct answer is C. Baby Gray was admitted with no signs or symptoms. On hospital day two, he developed fever and periods of bradycardia. A single common commensal was identified. Baby Gray does not meet either LCBI two or three criteria. Remember, you must have at least two matching common commensals and only a single common commensal micrococcus was identified in this case. All right, now let's move on to baby girls Belle and Bella. On 5-5, baby girls Belle and Bella were admitted to NICU after being born one month premature. On 5-8, there was new onset of apnea and the central line was placed. Both developed a low-grade fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit and two sets of blood cultures were drawn separately, both growing Staphylococcus hominis. No other source of infection was identified, were identified. What LCBI criterion is met by baby girls Belle and Bella? Okay, I hear some discussion going on. I'll give you a few more seconds before we discuss this case. The correct answer is C, LCBI 3 criteria. Yes. Let's look at the, let's do this question and then I'll provide the explanation on, on the next slide. Is this a POA or HAI infection? So it says POA or HAI for baby girls, Belle and Bella. <laughs> this infection is a POA. I'm sorry. This infection should be an HAI. Yeah, you're correct. Not a POA, but an HAI. All right, let's look at it. On 5-9, staph hominis blood cultures were collected times two. You have a central line that was inserted on 5-8. The date of event 
is 58 and your IWP is 5 and an IWP is created which is 56 through 512 apnea is noted on 58 58 again is your date of event because that is your first element used to meet the site specific infection this is an HAI HAI event because the date of event occurred on calendar day four. Is this event central line associated? There's no poll, just is this event central line associated? No, no it's not. Your central line was inserted on 5-8 and your positive blood cultures were collected on 5-9. Okay, so now let's move on to MBI LCBIs. MBI LCBIs are a subset of LCBIs. Before you can determine if a BSI event is an MBI LCBI, you must first fully meet LCBI criteria. The MBI LCBI category enables NHSN to identify bloodstream infections that are believed to be the result of gastrointestinal translocation due to a patient's weakened immune state and alterations of the gut. They are still considered primary BSIs because there is not an identifiable infection at another site. However, the gut is believed to be the seeding source of the bloodstream with colonizing organisms. MBIs are reported to NHSN, but since 2015 with the rebaseline, they are removed from the data shared with CMS for reimbursement determinations. This is the MBI LCBI table, which provides an overview of the MBI LCBI criteria. This table is located on page 4-10. MBI LCBI1 is a patient of any, includes a patient of any age that meets criterion for LCBI with at least one blood specimen identified by culture or non-culture based microbiologic testing, testing with only intestinal organisms from the MBI organism list. A partial list of MBI organisms can be found on page 4-31, or you can review the MBI organisms tab on the NHSN organisms list. The patient also must meet at least one of the following. The patient is an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipient within the past year with one of the following documented during the same hospitalization as your positive culture. Grade three or four gastrointestinal graft versus host disease or greater than a liter of diarrhea in a 24 hour period with onset on or within seven calendar days before the date the positive culture is collected. The patient may also meet the neutropenic element, which is defined as two separate days with values of absolute neutrophil count or your ANC or total white blood cell count less than 500 cells per millimeter cubed within a seven day period, which includes the date the positive blood culture was collected, which is day one, the three calendar days before and the three calendar days after. For an ANC or WC value to be eligible for use, they must occur within the seven days that includes the day of the positive blood specimen, the three days before, and the three days after. This time frame looks like an IWP and sounds like an IWP, but in this case, it is not. For the purpose of meeting MBI, LCBI criteria, 
Low AMC and WBC values are indicators or risks for infections, not symptoms of infection, and therefore not considered elements when applying this definition. This table is in the protocol and provides guidance on how to correctly determine if an ANC or WBC value are eligible for use in meeting MBI, LCBI criteria. In the first example, patient A first fully meets LCBI1 with the positive blood culture growing a rec recognized pathogen. Next, we can consider the MBI LCBI criteria because Canada's species is also an intestinal organism that is on the MBI list. The patient has the qualifying neutropenia on two separate days with WC values less than 500 cells. In this case, on day negative one, the WBCs are 320 and on day one are 400. So the final determination of this case is MBI, LCBI 1. Now let's look at patient B. Patient B fully meets LCBI 2 criteria with two positive blood specimens growing only Viridans group strep plus a qualifying fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius. This patient is also neutropenic on at least two separate days with ANC values less than 500. In this example, the value for day negative one is 110 and day negative two is 120. So the final determination in this case is MBI LCBI2. Please note days two, three, and four are also eligible for use as the ANC values are less than 500 cells. You can use a combination of ANC and WBC values provided they occur in the seven day time frame since these values are considered risk factors and do not affect the date of event. This table uses WBCs in two of the examples and ANC values in the other, but a combination of either ANC or WBC values can be used provided they are collected on different calendar days within the seven day time frame previously mentioned. This calculation is available in the BSI chapter if your laboratory does not provide an absolute ANC. Okay, let's try this again. Let's move on to Miss Patty Patty. On June 13th, Miss Patty had a central line inserted on admission. On June 16th, she had an a ANC level of 400. And on June 17th, two blood cultures were drawn that were positive for Enterococcus faecalis. On June 19th, the WBC levels were 210 cells per millimeter. No other source of infection was identified. Did the patient meet MBI, LCBI 1?
So the correct answer is yes. We first need to determine if LCBI criterion is met. Miss Patty is admitted on 613 and the positive blood cultures occur on 617. Because E. coli is a recognized pathogen, LCBI1 criterion is met on 617. Now we can evaluate for MBI, LCBI1. The organism identified, E. coli is an MBI organism. The risk factor present is neutropenia, is neutropenia. The patient has an A and C value of 400 and a WBC value of 200. Therefore, MBI, LCBI criterion is met. Please note, any combination of A and C and or WBC values can be used to meet neutropenic criteria, provided they are collected on separate days within the seven day period that includes the date of the positive blood specimen, the three calendar days before, and the three calendar days after. We've already discussed LCBI 2 and 3 criteria and the differences in the symptoms used based on age. MBI, LCBI 2 and 3 requires only Viridans group strep and Rothia species. These organisms are both common commensals and MBI organisms. In addition to the organism requirement, you must meet one of the following elements. The first element, the allogeneic stem cell transplant patients with gastrointestinal graft versus host disease or qualifying diarrhea. And the second is immunocompromised patients as demonstrated by qualifying neutropenia. These are the same risk factors identified for MBI, LCBI1 criteria. It is possible for a patient to meet both MBI, LCBI1 and MBI, LCBI2 at the same time. When this occurs, report the MBI, LCBI1 with the recognized path pathogen first and the Viridans group strep or Rothia species as pathogen 2. This is a reporting requirement of the NHSN application. Please note the phrase no other organisms and keep in mind that if a single common commensal is identified, it is considered a contaminant. When this occurs, MBI, LCBI2, or 3 criteria is not met because the patient would not meet LCBI2 or 3 criteria. In addition, when a blood specimen positive for an organism not included on the NHSN MBI organisms list is collected during the BSI RIT of an MBI LCBI, the initial MBI LCBI event is edited to an LCBI and the identified non-MBI organism is added. That was a mouthful. So just put a star on that slide. Review later. It's like a little homework here. All right. First, the patient fully meets LCBI2 with at least two blood specimens and matching common commensals, in this case, Viridans group strep, plus a fever greater than 38.1 degrees Celsius. Because we have neutropenia on two separate days occurring within the seven-day time frame, the patient will meet MBI, LCBI criteria with A and C levels of less than 500 cells. Please note values on days negative five and negative six cannot be used because they are outside of the seven-day time frame that includes the day of the positive blood culture, three days before and three days after.
So we have performed knowledge checks over LCBI and MBI LCBI criteria. Now let's look at the information needed when you send in a BSI, BSI email for review. If investigating a positive blood culture, the BSI team would like for you to send all organisms identified in the blood cultures, signs and symptoms, and associated dates if evaluating for an LCBI 2 or 3, date of the first access in an inpatient location, if the patient was admitted with the central line in place, and your MBI, LCBI risk factors if evaluating MBI, LCBI criteria. This is a new FAQ for 2019. In addition to this, if investigating the positive blood cultures, all organisms identified in the blood cultures are needed. Signs and symptoms associate signs and symptoms associated dates if evaluating. Sorry, this is this slide is a duplicate. All right. So let's move on to your CLAPSI data and accuracy. The accuracy of NHSN data is dependent on the accuracy of the surveillance determinations, data collection, and entry. It is very important that we get accurate numerators by strict adherence to the definitions and reporting instructions and accurate denominators by mapping your locations appropriately, collecting device days and patient days accurately based on the location type, which may have specific requirements. This is the BSI event data collection form that can be found under the data collection forms tab. As a reminder, the fields outlined in orange are the required CLAPSI exclusions beginning in 2019. However, the fields outlined in teal, greenish, bluish color, are the CLAPSI exclusions that are optional for 2019, but will become required in 2020. This is just the BSI event collection form in the NHSN applic application. The highlighted sections are from the BSI event data collection form, and I'm sure you're familiar with both the event information and details section. What I'd like for you to pay attention to is that middle section, which are your risk factors, and you will see the required fields as denoted by the asterisks and the conditions that were added to the BSI form this year. Your denominator requirements by location and device. Remember, if, you, if the patient has greater than two central lines, only report one central line day. For your specialty care areas, if both the permanent and temporary line are present, report the temporary line. This guidance is correct in the patient safety manual. Patient days, Report all inpatient days in all locations and your SCAs. For your patient days in your NICU location, report the patient days by birth weight. And this is just your birth weights highlighted here. I would just briefly mention if your central line denominator, da denominator data is incorrect, it can impact your SIR leading to inaccurate da data. Examples of some potential problems are counting a patient with two central lines as two rather than one central line day, or your electronic data import is happening twice a day rather than once per day. This is your denominator for your denominator form for your intensive care unit and other locations, not including your NICUs or your SCAs. This is the same information in the NHSN application. You will want to provide a sum of your total patient days and central line days for the month. If you have no CLAPSI events, be sure to check the no event box under CLAPSI.
For all locations, remember to report at the same time. Remember to count at the same time each day the number of patients on the unit and the number of patients with the central line. Apologize for it being cut off at the top, but this is your denominator form for specialty care areas um, in your oncology areas. Please report the number of patients with at least one central line if a patient has both a temporary and permanent central line. Again, this is the form in the NHSN application for your denominator, uh, for your denominator counts. Provide the sums for your total patient days, your temporary central line days, and your permanent central line days. Check know if a CLAPSI event, if there are no CLAPSI events reported for by the type of central line. So if there are no CLAPSI events reported, you would check no depending on the type of central line the patient has. The central lines are stratified by device, te device type. So you would look at the number of patients on the unit, the number of patients with a permanent central line, number of patients with your temporary central line, and again, for patients with both, report the temporary line only. And this is your denominator reporting form for your neonatal intensive care units. This is the same form in the NHSN application. Provide monthly sums for both your patient days and central line days and check the appropriate box if there is no CLAPSI events to report in the birth weight category. Patient days and central lines in the NICU are stratified by birth weight. So the number of patients on the unit by birth weight, the number of central the number of patients with a central line by birth weight and again your birth weights are listed here so a few words on electronic data validation electronic collection of summary data is acceptable but you must collect three months of concurrent data with both electronic and manual and the difference must be within plus or minus five five percent Once weekly denominator collection reduces the NHSN data collection burden and is eligible in ICUs and locate and ward location types, but you must have 75 or more central line days per month. For your patient days, collect the information daily and record both the total of weekly samples. So for example, if you collect this information every Tuesday and your monthly total, which is your total for every day in the month. The central line days are collected on a sink may be collected on a single day once a week and again we use the example of every Tuesday. Remember if you are doing sampling you need to fill in both your total patient days and your central line days for the month and your sample patient days and central line days, there is a calculation that requires this information. So let's recap the 2019 BSI protocol changes. Exclusion of viruses and parasites occurred in 2019 for LCBI criterion. Your data fields for ECMO and VAD became required, and these are two of the CLAPSI exclusions. Additional data fields were added that are optional in NHSN for a CLAPSI exclusion, and these are your epidermolysis bullosa, your Munchausen syndrome by proxy, your patient self-injection, or IVDA, pus at the vascular site, and group B strep in the first six days of life. So in summary, we know that surveillance and clinical definitions may not always align. 
Surveillance definitions must be adhered to strictly and consistently. Clapsies result in significant morbidity and mortality in U.S. hospitals. Progress has been made, but the journey continues. According to the 2017 HAI report, nationally among acute care hospitals, there was about a 9% decrease between 2016 and 2017. To wrap up primary BSIs, we have reviewed the forms, the data collection techniques, and data entry requirements for BSI events. We reviewed key definitions for BSI and CLAPSI surveillance. I've also provided an overview of the 2019 protocol with key changes, located the protocol and training materials on the NHSM website, and we were able to assess our current knowledge of the BSI protocol through knowledge checks. This year, we are accepting comments related to the BSI module of the patient safety component. This is a pilot and comments can be submitted between February 14th and April 15th of this year. This is an opportunity to identify issues and areas for potential improvement beginning in 2020. If you would like to submit your comment for review, please use the information provided in the last bullet. This is a reminder of the American Journal of Infection Control NHSN case study series resources that were used in the presentation and I'm and do you have any questions I'm not sure if we have time but are there any questions hi there um, so it doesn't make sense to me that we can count a non-accessed port say in the denominator but it wouldn't count for in, in the numerator Statistically, that just doesn't make any sense because your denominator should account for all of the patients eligible for the risk, which in this case is a CLAB C. Okay. I mean, I'm just, I, is that just designed to, for ease of use because it would be tough to count your denominator days? Yes. Okay. So, in several of the other um, modules, the device is counted when the when it is present for CLAPSI surveillance. If you remember, it used to be counted when the central line was accessed, and some facilities indicated that this was difficult to determine whether the central line was accessed yeah. or whether it wasn't accessed. So in 2018, we oh. made a decision to include all central lines, regardless of access, in your denominator device day count. Right. For well, thank you, because we could, I mean, essentially you're allowing us to game the system on patients who say come in and their, their port is never accessed, but they're adding days to the denominator. Right. It, it will add days to your denominator. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a question on the um, eligibility for doing the weekly denominator collection. Mm -hmm. In the NICU setting, can you do that? And is also on those 75 days, is that 75 days for all birth weight categories total or for each birth weight category, you must have 75 line days? Okay. So your question is regarding electronic collection of, no. The once this weekly one. denominator collection. Yes. So you can perform your weekly sampling in the NICU, um, whether or not it's by... Um, Is it 75 per birth weight category? Per birth weight or total, I would have to ask a member of the BSI team to make sure that of that answer. Okay, so they're telling me it is not used in the NICU. You cannot use it That's in what the NICU. That's what I'm Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. I have a question on the um, ECMO and VAD reporting. I know to actually call the BSI, it has to have been in place on the day of or the day before 
and has to have been in place greater than two days. But on the form where you, the data entry form, it just says yes or no. Mm -hmm. So if it were removed, say, five days before your your BSI event, is that is that a yes or a no? There was one, but it wasn't in that two-day period. That's a no. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Hello. Hi. So um, my, uh, it's more of a comment and then a question. So in my patient population, we're a cancer hospital. 75% uh -huh. of the collapses that I reported in, we reported in 2018, occurred in patients who had a median length of neutropenia before the event of six days. And the reason why we couldn't, we didn't meet the MBI criteria was because they were not on the list, on the MBI list. So what we saw, though, is that the majority of these patients were coag negative staph, staph aureus, and gram negatives such as pseudomonas, mm -hmm. all of which had been reported in the literature as being potential colonizers of the GI tract. So I would propose that we tend to look through the lens of a general acute care hospital when we're looking at these definitions and not really identifying the true the risks that occur in this population. Um, I would think that the 2,200 square feet of denuded GI surface and the prevent from the chemo and the radiation and the profound neutropenia would have more effect on the that bloodstream that bloodstream infection than actually the presence of a central line. So my question to you, if, and we will be commenting, <laughs> okay. is that what kind of data reports or what have you would you would the would the CDC like to see regarding evidence for expanding that MBI list? Uh, when you, as you said, you that you do plan to comment in the open comment. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Period. So we would like to see any. Um, in addition to your comment, attach any literature or um, evidence-based studies that would support the use of, that Adding would support uh, MBI identification with the organisms that you, you know, that you have indicated that you see most often. And we'll take that information back in and review, because to me, it sounds as if the MBI definition is not met because in your case, in most cases, MBI organisms were not identified. Right. They they were they met everything except for the, the organism. Bug. Yeah. And we often have um, neutropenia periods that last for thirty to sixty days while we wait for our patients to engraft. Right. right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. LCB2 and LCB3, the difference. How do you differentiate the two? Between LCBI2 two and, and LCBI3? LCBI three. Three. Yes. Um, for LCBI2, there are different signs and symptoms that are required, and those signs and symptoms are available in the BSI protocol. Um, for LCBI3, there is an age limitation of less than or equal to a year of age in addition to specific signs and symptoms seen in that patient population. Thank you. I just want to um, remind people that we have a tables of instructions and so the person that asked the question about the central line, yes or no, all of that information, we can't put, we simply can't put all of the instructions on the screens that, you know, you get on the computer. So that's why it's so important to look at the tables of instructions, because if you look for central line, the central line field, it will tell you that you only answer yes if the central line has been in place more than two days and was, a pres was present on the day before or the day of the event. So that is probably the most underutilized document that we have or those documents, the tables of instructions, really important to look at them when you're, if you have a question. Do you have a question from those viewing via web stream?
There's another question regarding when a patient has both a permanent and a temporary central line, are we only to count the temporary line? Yes, you should only count the temporary line in your denominator reporting. In the slides that are posted on the website and perhaps the slides you have in front of you, the instructions provided were incorrect. It's only the temporary line that should be reported in your denominator. Okay, and we have another question. For the denominator validation, if a health system has multiple facilities using the same electronic software, does each individual hospital have to validate manual counts or can the validation for the whole be done by manual counts at a few of the entities? I would say that each facility needs to perform the validation and for the manual and the electronic system. And one other question for LCBI2 and LCBI3, when it says blood specimens drawn on two separate occasions, what does that mean? Can you not have more than one full calendar day between collections? So the definition, um, for that or the the guidance provided for that and I, I can't recall the page number is that the blood specimen can either be collected on the same or consecutive days so you cannot have a calendar day between the the blood collections and what was the other part was that the only part of the question Susan? okay Are there any more questions? I have one more. And uh, what is a non-culture-based microbiological test method for CLABSI definition? Oh, you know, that's, that, that's, a, that's a huge question there. Um, I can provide you, we can provide you with examples, but we do not have a list of non-culture-based microbiologic testing. Um, we do receive questions regarding this. So some of the some of the testing methodologies that we see on occasion are your B BCID pan, uh, BCID assays, your fungital, um, PCR, but these are just examples. NHSN does not provide a list of non-culture based microbiological testing methodologies.